With guys like Peter Atia and Andrew Huberman talking about longevity, people are interested in longevity. And the more that that happens, the more blowhard crazy stuff that comes out. I want to talk about what could be considered the biggest controversial, almost kind of scam in the world of longevity science. But it's only a scam part of the time because we need to have a full understanding. I'm talking about zombie cells. Have you heard of this before? I've heard people talking about senescent cells are zombie cells. And I'll give you a quick breakdown of what they are and kind of an understanding, but this video is gonna be fairly in depth, but it's not to throw the whole senescent cell longevity research under the bus. It's valid, but how it's being marketed and overhyped is a little weird. You see, here's the deal. Like, zombies are bad. Zombies are always bad. I've never met a zombie that was doing good things for the economy, for the environment, for society. Zombies suck, okay? So when you call a senescent cell a zombie cell, you are implying that this cell is worthless and only doing bad things. So to understand this, like, what exactly is a senescent cell? A senescent cell is like a clone of another cell. So it's like you have a cell that's perfectly healthy and functioning, and then it creates sort of a half living version of itself that can do some things, but can't replicate, cannot procreate for lack of a better term. So as we get older, the abundance of senescent cells seems to increase because we have less ability to deal with them and clear them out. But the bigger problem isn't so much the abundance of senescent cells as it is what they secrete. They secrete something called senescence-associated secretory phenotypes, SASPs. And these are very inflammatory type things. They're pro-inflammatory molecules that are secreted. So the more we have of these clone cells, the more inflammation we potentially have. So the argument makes sense that as we get older and we have more of these senescent cells or zombie cells, it becomes a bigger problem and they are a larger contributor to poor longevity or early aging. But then why do we have them? Like we don't just have things that are out to kill us and out to destroy us. I'm gonna give you a little context here. Like in today's world, if we looked at insulin resistance, we'd say insulin resistance is a terrible thing and it should be gone. Well, it's only a problem in our lifestyle of abundance. A hundred years ago, insulin resistance could have saved our lives and was actually an evolutionary thing that made sense. It would tell us basically, hey, we have enough carbohydrates, we don't need to absorb them, switch gears to fat. So by making the body insulin resistant, it was sort of an evolutionarily necessary thing to get the body to shift gears from carbohydrates to fat. Today, it's a problem. So if we look at senescent cells and where they come into play, we look at the tumor suppressing theory of longevity, really. And what this theory ultimately says is that well, a senescent cell, and this is very important, a senescent cell is created as sort of a proxy of another cell. But they're created when DNA damage starts to increase and we start to see an increase in mutations. So let's say there is a cell that has some damage and it's a little bit funky. We don't want that cell to go crazy and procreate a bunch because it's already a little bit mutated. So the body says, hey, let's create a carbon copy of this cell that can still do its work, but it can't procreate. It's like you look at someone and you're like, man, that person is contributing a lot to society, but holy cow, do they have some flaws. If we could just keep that person and clone them, but make it so they can't make babies because they're a little off, that's kind of what's going on here. The body's just like, hey, you're cool, but you're also a little weird. So we don't really want you having babies, but we want you to keep doing your work. So essentially, in the case of our bodies, it's not safe for these cells to keep proliferating. It could cause damage. So we create proxies that go and do things. Why is that a bad thing? It's only a bad thing when they start to really get larger and we get a lot of them. There's a study that was published in the journal Mechanisms of Aging and Development that said it quite eloquently. They said, the same things that protect us can also kill us. And that makes so much sense. It's just like a weapon, right? It can protect us, but if things go awry, they can also harm us. And anything when you look in the world of longevity that we're trying to kind of work with and adulterate, we have to keep a thoughtful eye out for this. So think of it like this. There's two problems that come with senescent cells. Number one is we have a decrease in regeneration potential. 
Okay, senescent cells are going to slow down regeneration potential because they don't replicate. They potentially can heal or do some work, but they can't replicate and they cannot regenerate. So when you're young, we can regenerate our own cells and we can actually repair. When we get older, we have issues repairing. Okay, the other issue is the issue I mentioned before. As we get more of these senescent cells, they create more inflammation. And as our bodies get older, we have less ability to deal with the inflammation and less ability to get rid of, in a healthy fashion, these proxy senescent cells. So they start to build up and build up and build up and secrete inflammation. It's actually called inflammaging. There's an actual term for it. This explains a lot of what happens as we get older. But now we need to understand where senescent cells are so important when we're younger and how if we try to block them early, it can backfire. Okay, remember this. From an evolutionary perspective, once we have kids, there is no reason for the body to keep us alive. It makes sense to promote survival for us when we're young, but it doesn't make sense to promote survival once the kids are born and essentially raised a little bit. We're useless at that point to survival. Now, you could argue that with men, it's a little bit different to gauge than with women because who knows, like men can get their rocks off wherever. Women, if they have a kid, a pretty biological footprint that's there. But who knows, women still live longer than men, so I don't know there. But there was a study that was published in the journal Science. It took a look at something called P16. It's a molecule that is a marker of senescent cells. And what they found is that this marker was also associated with lung healing, demonstrating that when we're younger, senescent cells can actually help heal things. And in this particular case, heal the lungs. You see, when the body has energy, when it has enough available NAD, nicotinamide, adenide, dinucleotide, and it can actually fuel regeneration and fuel the proper proxy of a senescent cell, and it has enough energy to triangulate and corral things where they're supposed to go, these things work in our favor for regeneration. But there's a number of things that stack up. NAD goes down as we age, so our energy availability goes down essentially. More senescent cells build up, more inflammation, less NMN, less all of these things that are associated and kind of tie in together. Less sirtuin activation, less FOXO. What does all this gobbledygook mean? It means that as we lose cellular energy and as we get weaker and more decrepit cells, it all caves in on each other. I also did put a link down below if you're interested in trying Verso's NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide. It's a precursor to NAD. Definitely not making any crazy claims here at all. My suggestion is that if you're interested in the world of longevity research and potential longevity supplements, you might want to give them a peek because they're pretty interesting what they're doing. They have a product called Cell Being, which utilizes nicotinamide mononucleotide and transresveratrol. And these compounds synergistically can potentially help activate sirtuins and potentially increase NAD levels. NAD, nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide, is a compound in the body that is essentially cellular energy. And without it, we'd be dead in 15 to 30 seconds. So there's a lot of research behind NMN. Dr. David Sinclair has talked about nicotinamide riboside and nicotinamide mononucleotide a number of times. So that link down below saves you 15% off if you want to check them out. They are a sponsor on this channel, full transparency, but the net impression of this video is not go buy this product. The net impression of this video is to give you the playbook. It's just a relevant thing that I think you should take advantage of if you're interested in that arena. So that link is down below, top line of the description underneath this video. Also, their compounds are really cool because they ship them quickly so that you can put them in the fridge. People don't, a lot of times, don't put these things in the fridge. You should keep them cold stored. And they store them cold before they ship them so that they maintain the integrity. With NMN, that's very, very, very important. So anyhow, that link is down below just beneath this video. Okay, there was another study published in Developmental Cells that found that senescent cells were critical for wound healing. As a matter of fact, when they knocked out or they got rid of senescent cells, wound healing was significantly slower. So again, once here we have, when senescent cells are created, they can be allocated to a proper area. I want you to think of it sort of like, you could clone yourself, okay? But if you clone yourself, you run the risk of that clone falling in love with your wife, right? That's a problem, right? Because you just cloned yourself. You're gonna have the same interests, the same likes, right? So it would be a big problem if 
that happened and you ended up with like other kids, like, I mean, it could be a huge problem, right? You can see how it could be a disaster. But what if you could clone yourself and have that clone go to work for you? And you could just stay home with your wife. That'd be kind of cool, right? Or what if you could clone yourself and that clone could go run your errands? So when you're young and you have the energy, you can create that clone and that clone can go do some wound healing for you. Oh, we need an extra wound healing cell. Boom, fibroblast, go, right? It's pretty darn interesting. But guess what? It even applies to building muscle. This study was published in the FASEB journal. It found that senescent cells can actually migrate into regenerating muscle tissue and stimulate muscle repair. So basically, without senescent cells, you'd have a decrease in fiber growth and you'd have a decrease in satellite cells. When you go to build muscle, you need the satellite cells to fuse to the muscle to get it to grow. Senescent cells seem to be a very important part of that. Oh, you just worked out? Hey, let's create some proxies so they can help heal while we do the rest of our work. See what I'm saying here? But now we have to understand that there is a body of research and a body of compounds that are called synolytics. And synolytics look to sort of, sort of neutralize or get rid of these senescent cells. But my important point here is I'm gonna talk about which compounds you can use. You don't wanna be doing this when you're young. Like, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Your young years should be about growth, pro-growth in a responsible way. Capitalize on building tissue when you're young and then capitalize on preserving it when you're older. You can still build when you're older, but preserving it is going to be more important because if you start blocking senescent cells when you're young, you block all this amazing stuff. And senolytics are compounds that are designed to stop cell senescence. We don't want to do that when we're young, but we definitely want to do it when we're old. So what's interesting is that the journal Physiology had published a paper showing that reducing senescent cells in older people stopped sarcopenia, stopped muscle wasting. How about that? But stopping senescent cells in younger people slowed down regeneration. Pretty interesting how that works, because as the senescent cells build up in an older person too much, they become a problem and the inflammation can actually degrade the muscle. But in a younger person, the senescent cells help us build. It's not all potato, potato, remember that. But let's talk about some fun stuff because there's a study that was published in Nature Communications that used AI machine learning to analyze 4,000 different compounds, both natural and artificial, that would impact senescent cells and act as senolytics. And they actually came out with three natural compounds using machine learning that really analyzed a lot of data. Pretty interesting. They found for one, ginkgetin, which comes out of ginkgo biloba, is one of the most powerful compounds for senescent cells. Like, ginkgo went away for a while. Like, I remember that was like a thing when I was like a kid growing up in the 90s. Like, that was like, get little ginkgo shots and stuff like that. And it was like, go to Chinatown. I live near San Francisco. You go to Chinatown and you could just buy ginkgo like crazy. It was like the thing to do. Well, not really. It was just something that I'd do. But anyway, point is, is that ginkgo was cool. I think ginkgo is going to make a big resurgence because of these studies that are suggesting how powerful it is as a synolytic. Additionally, there's something called periplosin. Periplosin comes from a particular bark. So periplosin you'd need to use in a supplement form. But if you go on Amazon, you can find periplosin. It does exist. Full disclaimer, I would recommend starting with the ginkgo. I would start with like two servings of ginkgo morning and night and really wouldn't do it until you're maybe over 40. Or if you're someone that really beats your body up hard, maybe 35. And the next one is oleandrin. This is kind of interesting because I grew up having horses, right? And oleander bushes, oleanders, super toxic. Like if the horses would eat the oleanders, it was a problem. It would make them colic, it would cause all kinds of issues, but it could also be very, very bad for them. Oleander is toxic. But it turns out this oleandrin comes from oleander and it's a powerful synolytic. So it's interesting how just poison can actually be beneficial in certain ways. So it gets, again, you can get it in a supplement form. I can't tell you exactly how much to take, but you could do a quick Google search. But then if you look at some other studies, they look at other compounds. Two that are very important and very easy to get, quercetin and curcumin. Curcumin you have to take for a while though. You're not gonna get into an effect immediately. Whereas quercetin is a powerful flavonoid, has a lot of potential. 
uh, as an anti-inflammatory, as an antioxidant, and as a senolytic compound. So I would recommend 500 to 1,000 milligrams of quercetin. And I think that even young people can get away with taking that because it does have senolytic properties, but it also has amazing properties with FOXO3 and other longevity-oriented things. I take 1,000 milligrams of quercetin daily, but I also eat a lot of capers and a lot of uh, like things like asparagus that are rich in quercetin to begin with. So is it total bogus? Is it totally a scam? No, it's not, but at the same time, it has the potential to be because they're not zombie cells. They're cells that we need, and zombies are useless. I'll see you tomorrow.